Your Honours, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Carolyn Evans. I'm the Dean of the Melbourne Law School. And on behalf of my colleagues and our students, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here for the 2012 Seabrook Chambers Lecture to be delivered by Justice Shah on judicial activism for social justice, promises and perils. We meet today on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Uh, I've been asked to tell you that tonight's lecture is being recorded. This may have been self-evident to you, uh, but please bear that in mind during question time. Tonight, we're grateful for the generosity and foresight of the former judges of the Accident Compensation Tribunal who came together over a decade ago to fund the Seabrook Chambers Lectureship, a series of lectures to be given by people of international repute on issues relating to the rule of law and judicial independence in Australia and internationally. I'm sure that you'll agree we have a wonderful fit with our visitor tonight. Melbourne Law School tonight is particularly delighted to be partnering with the Australia Indra Institute and I recognise its director, Professor Matu, who is here with us tonight, to bring you tonight's lecture. For those of you who are not familiar with the Institute, the Australia Indra Institute is a leading centre for the study of India based here at the University of Melbourne uh, and it's been a wonderful addition to ensure stronger and deeper relationships between this university and our counterparts in India. I'm now very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Justice Shah. Justice Shah was appointed as a judge of the Bombay High Court in 1992 and later elevated to the office of Chief Justice in Madras High Court in 2005 and on transfer took over as the Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court in May 2008 until his retirement in 2010. During his time on the court, he had to work with a wide range of complex, social important legal issues from freedom of information to the decriminalisation of homosexuality to improving prison conditions. Justice Shah is currently the chairperson of the Broadcasting Contents Complaints Council, a self-regulatory body appointed by the Indian Broadcasting Foundation. He's also head of committee by the Planning Commission for drafting privacy laws and data protection law. He's a member of the governing council appointed by the Ministry of Law and Justice for Judicial Reforms and is actively involved with issues relating to the rights of slum dwellers, displaced persons and religious minorities. Australian lawyers, and, and I speak particularly for the public lawyers, watch Indian courts with great interest in developments in India where the judiciary take a far more active role in resolving controversial socio and economic issues than we're used to in our system. I know I'm going to be fascinated to hear more tonight from a man with such a distinguished career as a judge in this area. There'll be a short period for questions at the end, which will be chaired by my colleague, Professor Adrienne Stone, Director of the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies. Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in welcoming tonight's Seabrook Chambers Lecturer, Justice A.P. Shah. Ladies and gentlemen, let me first thank Melbourne Law School and Australia India Institute for inviting me to address this distinguished audience. I'm really honored by your invitation, Professor Ivans and, and Mr. Bhattu. The subject of my speech is judicial activism for social justice, promises and perils. In his book, Rule of Law, Lord Bingham quotes the words of Thomas Fuller, be you never so high, the law is above you. The rule of law is the bedrock of all modern constitutions and is the closest that we have to a universal secular religion. The question is, however, who makes the law? Parliament or the judiciary? The traditional orthodoxy was that the parliament makes the laws and the judiciary interprets them. The advent of judicial activism has challenged this traditional orthodoxy. At its heart, 
judicial activism may be defined as the imposition of a judicial solution over an issue that earlier was subject to political resolution. Judicial activism is a subject that evokes mixed and usually extreme reactions in most jurisdictions of either admiration or criticism. Critics say that it amounts to usurpation of power by an unelected court and may serve as a censor to legislation by an elected legislature. The admirers consider judicial activism as an, not as an aberration, but as a normal judicial function. In India particularly, the Supreme Court has emerged in the recent times as a powerful voice of constitutional governance in the face of a weak executive. Much has been said and written about it in our country, and it provides a fascinating study to outsiders. But before we move on to India, let us just take a brief survey of the understanding of judicial activism in the major common law jurisdictions. In England, the thought of judicial activism has been blunted by the supremacy of the parliament and the rare attempts as that of Lord Coke in Bonham's case to secure such power for the courts failed miserably. The courts in England have therefore directed judicial activism against the executive and only subtly and indirectly against the parliament without challenging the parliament's authority to legislate. However, there are pockets of change in UK. The slow integration of English law with the rest of Europe, the subtle shifts in the center of power from London to Strasbourg, and the passing of Human Rights Act 1998 have altered the traditional understanding of parliamentary supremacy in UK. In US, the courts have had the power of judicial review since Marbury versus Madison in 1803. However, the story of judicial activism in the US is not unlike the rest of the world. And the actual tendencies of the judiciary has been subject of much criticism. When the court made a series of objections to President Roosevelt's regulation of the economy in 1930s, the liberals, the liberals deemed the court reactionary. When the Warren Court sought to expand the rights of the African Americans, the conservation, cons conservatives called the court adventurist. After the decision of the Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education, the conservatives threatened to impeach the judges and burnt effigies of Chief Justice Warren in protest. Ladies and gentlemen, Australia is also no stranger to this perennial debate as judicial activism has been severely criticized by a number of voices, both within and outside the legal system. Justice Deason Hayden of the Australian High Court claims that judicial activism undermines the rule of law. He reserves the strongest criticism for the activist judge who overreaches his powers and invokes the judicial power for a purpose other than that for which it was granted. According to one writer, however, the criticism of the activist judges is more vocal in case the beneficiary of the court's decision is from outside the ranks of the socially powerful, as was in the case of indigenous communities in the decision of Mabo versus Queensland. Whenever the pendulum of justice recognizes the inequitable position of the less powerful and underprivileged and seeks to redress it, the backlash is more acute. And such acts are quickly branded as judicial overreach. Anguished by these attacks, Justice Michael Kirby has said that judicial activism has become a code phrase for denunciation and demonization 
mainly by people of a conservative social and professional disposition. Ladies and gentlemen, my speech deals mainly with our experience of judicial activism in India, where the judiciary has transformed itself into an institution enjoined to promote the ideals of socio-economic and political justice. The Indian judiciary is no longer simply an institution adjudicating disputes between the parties. The least dangerous branch has become India's most powerful organ. For some, the Indian judiciary is the sanctuary of Indian humanity. And for others, it is the world's most powerful court. The transition came about slowly but drastically and provides a fascinating study. My speech is broadly divided into four parts. The first part deals with the approach of the Supreme Court from 1950 to 1975. During this period, principally, the constitutional discourse was about right to property, which was subject matter of several amendments. The second part discusses the transformation of the Supreme Court post the emergency period. The court transformed itself from a positivist to an activist court. And this period is marked by steady expansion of the fundamental rights by reading into them the socio-economic rights, which are non-justiciable. The third part deals with the novel procedural innovations of social action litigation or public interest litigation, what is known as PIL, access and democratization of judicial process. Finally, we shall discuss the role of the court and the issues of legitimacy and efficiency of PIL. From the very inception, the Supreme Court of India strictly followed the traditions of the British courts and thereby began as a positivist court. In a decision rendered immediately after the birth of the Constitution in 1950, in A.K. Gopalan versus State of Madras, a case relating to the liberty of a detainee placed under detention, the court took a very narrow view of the right to life and liberty in Article 21 of the Constitution. The court remarked, and I quote, outside the restricted field of constitutional limitations, our parliament and the state legislatures are supreme in the respective legislative fields. And in that wider field, there is no scope for the court in India to play the role of Supreme Court of United States. This perception changed by the time Golaknath's case in 1967, where the Supreme Court declared that Parliament could not amend the Constitution to take away or abridge the fundamental rights. Six years later, in Keshavananda Bharti's case, while overruling Golaknath, the court evolved another far-reaching doctrine under which Parliament was denied the power to amend the Constitution in a manner that violated the basic structure. The court said that the parliament could amend the constitution, but it should not affect the basic structure. The court identified the power of judicial review as being a part of basic structure of the constitution. This power made the Indian Supreme Court the most powerful apex court in the world. It also made it a supremely political institution because the ultimate determination of basic structure was bound to be a political judgment. In 1975, an emergency was declared in the country following Prime Minister Indira Gandhi's disqualification in the election case. Her election was set aside by a judge of Allahabad High Court and thereafter she declared emergency in the country. Many politicians, journalists, and social activists were arrested under the Maintenance of Security Act. The detentions were challenged in the courts, but they were met with the government's plea that Article 21, which guaranteed the fundamental right to life and liberty, was the sole repository of power, and as the right to enforce for enforcement of that right had been suspended by presidential notification, 
petitions to enforce this right were liable to be dismissed at the threshold. This objection had been overruled by nine high courts who displayed remarkable and robust independence in upholding the fundamental freedoms of the detainees who were arrested illegally and arbitrarily. This was, however, reversed by the Supreme Court in ADM Jabalpur versus Shivkan Shipla, which got, granted a card blanche to the government to detain persons with no relief from the courts. The decision in Jabalpur was severely criticized. Out of five, four justices who support, supported the government's view became Chief Justice of India. The lone dissenter, Justice H.R. Khanna, was denied Chief Justiceship. Professor C.K. Allen described this judgment as the contribution of the Supreme Court to the emergency. This decision cost the court the social esteem it enjoyed. For the common people, the court was an elitist institution which supported the political establishment. Post-emergency judicial activism was probably inspired by the court's realization that its elitist social image would not make it strong enough to withstand the future onslaught by a powerful political establishment. Therefore, consciously or unconsciously, the court began moving in the direction of the people. In this context, I would like to mention one decision which, is, which really turned the court into a activist Supreme Court. That is Manika Gandhi versus Union of India. In Manika Gandhi versus Union of India, the court was concerned with a very small issue of impounding of a passport of the petitioner without following, following process of law. Now, this issue could have been decided without commenting upon the rights under the Constitution, but the court, for the first time, breathed life into Article 21 by introducing the concept of due process in it. The Constituent Assembly's debate show that the framers purposely avoided due process clause in the Constitution, presumably on the advice of Justice Felix Frankfurter of the US Supreme Court. It seems that Justice Frankfurter told the Secretary of the Constituent Assembly that this due process clause has created some problem in America in the sense that the, some economic legislations of Roosevelt, President Roosevelt were turned down by the, by the American Supreme Court by recourse to due process. In Manika Gandhi, a law after Manika Gandhi, a law depriving a person of life and liberty not only had to be fair and reasonable, but it had also to meet a possible challenges from the other articles, like Article 14, which guarantees equality before law, and Article 19, that is fundamental freedoms. Thus, the court's power to strike down legislation was now expanded to include critical examination of a statute, even on the basis of the substantive element of due process. Now, by such wide interpretation, the court recognized the rights of host of, the per host of persons, like under trial, prisoners, prison inmates, children under Juvenile Delinquency Act. Court re-examined the validity of the provisions of penal law sanctioning death sentence. Ultimately, the validity of death sentence was confirmed on the principle of rarest of the rare cases. And court also held that the right to privacy, right to speedier trial, right to an independent judiciary, right to efficient and honest governance are all part of Article 21. This right expansion was not just limited to an expansive reading of the fundamental rights chapter in Indian Constitution, most imp but the court started looking at the other provisions of the Constitution. And most important chapter was Chapter 4, which contained socio-economic rights, but they were non-justiciable. The framers of the Indian Constitution followed the model of the Irish Constitution, which differentiates in its Bill of Rights between justiciable rights and non-justiciable directive principles. Part three of the Indian Constitution contains justiciable civil and political rights. Part four, by contrast, 
contains the socio-economic rights, which are called directive principles, which although aim to be fundamental in the governance of the country, are expressly non-justiciable. Article 37 states that it shall be the duty of the state to apply these principles in lawmaking, but that the principles shall not be enforced by any court. The traditional view was, and I think it is also the view in Australia and several other countries, that the distinction between civil and political rights and socio-economic rights lies in that former give rise to justified duties of restraint, while the latter was associated with non-justiciable positive duties. Thus, many jurisdictions simply exclude socio-economic rights from a justiciable Bill of Rights. I think the Australia doesn't have a Bill of Rights in the Constitution. One of the strongest exponents of this view is the Supreme Court of United States. The US Supreme Court has held that the due process clause does not spell out any positive duties for the government. Judges in UK asserted that these issues are altogether ill-suited for determination by courts and court procedures, and it should be left to the political uh, establishment to decide upon the positive duties. Now, this textual demarcation need not conclusively exclude positive duties. The boundary between civil and political rights and socioeconomic rights is hardly a secure one. Since civil and political rights are fully capable of giving rise to positive duties, thus the role of boundary drawing in practice falls to the courts. Now, the Indian Supreme Court has recognized a range of positive duties on the basis of right to life incorporated in Article 21. The Article 21 says that no person shall be deprived of right to life and liberty without following the procedure established by law. Rather than viewing the directive principles of state policy as simply unenforceable, it has drawn on these principles as a rich source of interpretation of the rights contained in Article 21. The court enlarged the scope of life in Article 21 to include the dignity of the individual and the worth of the human person. The court said that life does not mean merely animal existence or continued treachery through life, but the finer graces of human civilization which makes life worth living. The right to life has been held to include right to primary education, right to work, right to livelihood, right to education, right to shelter, and the right to childhood. So Article 21 was expanded to include all these socio-economic rights which are incorporated in part four of the Constitution and which are made expressly non-justiciable. Now, the, there is a now an increasing acceptance of the need to move beyond the divide between justiciable duties of restraint and non-justiciable duties. Some of the modern constitutions such as South Africa, Finland, and Kenya provide for non-justiciable rights, economic rights. Out of this, I would like to refer to briefly few judgments of the South African Constitutional Court. After the draft constitution was prepared by the Constituent Assembly, it was sent to the South African Constitutional Court for its certification. The court in the certification proceedings observed that the fact that socio-economic rights will almost inevitably give rise to budgetary implications does not seem to us to be a bar to their justiciability. At the very minimum, socio-economic rights can be regular, negatively protected from improper invasion. There were two important cases in, before the South African Constitutional Court. The first dealt with the right to shelter, right of children to shelter, and in the, that is Grootbroom case. And the second case was Minister of Health versus Treatment Action Campaign, a case regarding supply of nevirapine drug for combating the risk of mother to child transmission of HIV AIDS. The South African Constitutional Court has preferred to use the structure of progressive duties 
because the reasonable standard is thought to better accommodate the balance between the executive and the court. In TSC, in the second case, the court was more emphatic. The court said that where the results of the judicial proceedings indicate that the constitution has been breached, the court had a duty to devise effective remedy. And in that case, the court ordered that this drug should be, should be uh, supplied in all government hospitals. There is also a change in UK about the socio-economic rights, whether the court should determine the extent of these rights. There's an interesting article by Lord Stain titled Deference, a Tangled Story. He says, in common law adjudication, it is an everyday occurrence for courts to consider, together with principled arguments, the balance sheet of policy advantages and disadvantages. It would be a matter of public disquiet if the courts did not do so. Of course, in striking the balance, courts may arrive at a result unacceptable to parliament. In such cases, parliament can act with great speed to re reverse the effect of a decision, but there is no need to create a legal principle requiring the courts to abstain from ruling on policy matters or resource allocation issues. Ladies and gentlemen, the bold and dynamic interpretation of the substantive constitutional rights is just one part of the story of judicial activism in India. Equally important aspect of judicial activism was the emergence of the public interest litigation. In 1979 and 1980, 33 detainees were blinded by the prison authorities in the Indian town of Bhagalpur in Bihar state in order to coerce their confessions. A newspaper journalist wrote a scathing expose and a lawyer sent this article to the Supreme Court. This resulted in the birth of what was known as epistolary jurisdiction. The court ordered the state of Bihar to provide medical treatment for the detainees and pensions for their families and in subsequent hearings monitored the rehabilitation of victims over the course of next few years. Since the time of independence, the entire Indian court procedure was drawn from Anglo-Saxon system of jurisprudence, thereby leaving most of the citizens aware, unaware of the, their legal rights, much less in a position to assert them. Guarantees of fundamental rights and assurances of directive principles described as the conscience of the Constitution would have remained empty promises for the majority of the illiterate and indigent citizens under adversarial proceedings. However, these instances of taking up causes in public interest and seeking enforcement of rights of others from the judiciary brought about a major transformation of standing in Indian law. Expanding the concept of justiciable public interest and prescribing an activist role for the judiciary in securing justice for the nation's voiceless, the court permitted outsiders to agitate the rights guaranteed by the constitution on behalf of countries dispossessed, among them bonded laborers, women and children from destitute homes, migrant laborers, slum dwellers, and so on and so forth. This transformation of standing in a public interest litigation began gradually. A letter was written by a prisoner about the torture of a fellow prisoner. The court responded to that letter, and from that response came the first judicial discourse on prisoners' rights. Thereafter, a habeas corpus petition was filed by a lawyer, Kapila Hingorani, based on journalist report that 18 detainees who had been waiting trial longer than the terms to which they could have been sentenced had they been tried and convicted. They were still in jail, though the maximum punishment which could have been awarded to them had expired. The court undertook its own finding. This was complaint was only about the 18 detainees. And the court undertook its own finding through an appointed commission and discovered over 80,000 such prisoners, ordering the Sessions Court to try 
the detainees' cases, the Supreme Court monitored their slow progress, and ultimately the court ordered the detainees' release and compensation. The public interest litigation became a conscious attempt on the part of the judiciary to transform the constitutional promises into reality and open the doors to those groups of people who were not free to approach the courts due to socioeconomic factors rather than physical restraint. The full liberalization of standing came about in 1982, and the Supreme Court held that any citizen who is acting bona fide and who has sufficient interest has to be accorded a standing. By recognizing the inherent inequalities in adversary court system, the court has to change its procedure. The court, in this process, the court uh, disregarded the res restrictive dogmas such as rules of pleadings, rules of evidence, rules regarding standing to sue, and they all fail by the wayside. Now, what the court did that after receiving the complaint from a citizen about the human rights violation of persons or class of persons, the court appointed commissions such as district judges, journalists, lawyers, mental health professionals, bureaucrats, and expert bodies have been appointed to carry investigations in the matter of human rights violations. In environmental matters, the court has relied upon expert bodies like uh, the, the uh, uh, CPCB and NERI to study the situation and submit a report to the court. The court has also drawn upon empirical data and expert studies to decide whether pavement dwellers' right to life and livelihood would be affected by their eviction. Senior advocates in the Supreme Court have assisted it as amicus curiae in several cases, including that of police excesses, forest, and public accountability. So in its new role as a social auditor, the court set for itself a new socio-economic destination and consequently formulated meta rights, which are the collective social rights and duties of groups, classes, and communities. <coughs> the court said in, in uh, a 1970 case, it must be remembered that this is not a litigation of an advisory, advisory, uh, adversary character undertaken for the purpose of holding the state government or its officer responsible for making reparation, but it is a public interest litigation which involves a collaborative and cooperative effort on the part of the state government and its officers and the lawyers appearing in the case and the bench for the purpose of making human rights meaningful for the weaker sections of the society. There is another very fascinating accept aspect of the public interest litigation is the legislations that the Supreme Court had enacted through directions. I would give example of two cases. The parliament had not laid down any law to regulate the in inter-country adoption of children by foreigners, and such children could be fail prey to exploitation. In Lakshmikan Pandey versus Union of India, the court responding to a writ petition laid down directions for regulating such adoptions, and these directions have been in force for several years now. The court said that the parliament can make a legislation to regulate the adoptions, but these guidelines which were issued in 1980 are still in force, and they are still being followed. So in these matters, the court was not really making law in the, realistic juris in the sense of realistic jurisprudence, but the court was actually legislating. There is a, a very interesting judgment of the Supreme Court in Vishakha versus State of Rajasthan. There, in response to a petition by a women's rights group, the court laid down guidelines to combat sexual harassment of women at workplace and laid down guidelines, detailed guidelines, in respect of the private sector as well as the government sector. It observed that the government of India had made certain international legal commitments concerning women's equality by ratifying SIDOM. So the court said that there is a legitimate expectation of the people of India that the parliament would pass a law in conformity with SIDOM. And since the law is not passed, the court issued directions 
and declared it as a law of the country under Article 141 of the Constitution. Now, interestingly, this judgment was given in 2000. The law about the uh, sexual harassment of women at the workplace was finally enacted by Government of India just two weeks back. And surprisingly, the law is exactly in conformity with the directions which were issued by the Supreme Court in 2000. The court has issued orders relating to a wide range of PILs covering matters such as prison and prisoners, the police, the armed forces, children, child labor, bonded labor, urban space, environment and resources, consumer issues, education, politics and elections, and, and public policy and accountability, human rights, and even the judiciary. It will be worthwhile only to look at the two or three areas where the court has made some significant contribution. The first is the environmental law. The court drew upon the concept of sustainable development, balancing ecology and development, which had become part of customary international law. Now, bearing once for all the host of strict liability of Reland versus Fletcher, the court in oleum gas leak case asserted that hazardous activity can be tolerated only on the condition that the enterprise which uses such hazardous, odd, or inherently dangerous activities indemnifies all those who suffer on account of carrying on this activity, regardless of whether it was carried carefully or not. I think even in Australia, the Reland versus Fletcher has doctrine has been has been done away with. Now the court introduced polluter pays principle, precautionary principle in the Indian constitutional law. There was a young lawyer by name M.C. Mehta who brought all these environmental petitions before the Supreme Court. These included the issues arising out of leak of oleum gas from a factory in Delhi, pollution in Delhi, basically on account of vehicular traffic. Then there were cases of river pollution by tanneries, then there was danger to Taj Mahal from the Mathura refinery. In all these cases, court interfered and the and, uh, appropriate directions were issued. But the directions issued by the court became controversial in certain respects. For instance, to protect the forest cover, the Supreme Court issued directions that all tree felling should be stopped in northeast region of the country. The court also directed that all, saw, all sawmills in that area should be, should be closed. Now, these directions had a severe impact on the life of the poor and tribal people living in that, in that forest. I mean, the wholesale settlements of tribals were removed because of their proximity with the, with the forest area. There is one case which I would like to refer because at a later stage, it came before me when I was in Delhi High Court. I don't know whether you have seen these cycle rickshaws uh, uh, in India. I mean, these are rickshaws are actually these are cycle rickshaws, and then these people, cycle rickshaw pullers, they work on a meager salary of say around seventy to hundred rupees. That would be equivalent to one and a half Australian dollar per day. Now, this Punjab Cycle Rickshaw Act provided th that licenses, licenses to ply rickshaws could be given only to those owners who run the rickshaws. So a puller has to be owner. The logic behind this was that persons might purchase number of rickshaws and give it to, I mean, poor people to ply the rickshaw and they exploit them. So the act said that the puller has to be owner of the rickshaw. The act was challenged on the ground that it would affect the right to carry on any trade, business, or occupation guaranteed by Article 191G of the Constitution. The Supreme Court in 1987, speaking through Justice Krishna here, instead of striking down the law, provided a scheme whereby the rickshaw pullers could obtain loans from a nationalized bank. So the intention of the legislature was to to stop the exploitation of the poor was achieved and the, with the support from the bank. But anyway, 20 years later, 
this issue came before me while I was sitting in Delhi High Court. And this rule was again challenged that owner, owner plier policy was questioned again. The government of Delhi had imposed a ban on number of cycle rickshaws in the city. According to this rule, there could be only 90,000, 99,000 cycle rickshaws in the city, whereas at the relevant time, the number of cycle rickshaws were 1 million. And so therefore, the all remaining, except those 99,000, all were declared, all were, I mean, treated as illegal. Now, with this meager salary, when the rickshaw puller, I mean, he works for the whole day and gets a, I mean, 75 or 80 rupees, had to pay to the corporation employees, to the police, because the, his activity was not in accordance with law. So we held that the, though the rule was upheld by the highest court of the country, we decided to strike down this rule. And we said that in view of the, particularly in view of the, the problems faced on account of environmental pollution, the cycle rickshaw should be encouraged. And we struck down that rule. And <laughs> so, uh, and this is perhaps only one decision where the, the lower court has held that in light of changed circumstances, the order passed by the highest court need not be followed. And this decision was incidentally endorsed by the Supreme Court, I think, in this, uh, in this year. There is another important case that is right to food. That is one of the most successful PILs in the country. Although India has a plethora of food distribution schemes, there was little impetus to implement them until a civil society group moved the Supreme Court. The court transformed the right to food into a fundamental human right. The court's comments are very, very telling. In case of famine, there may be shortage of food, but here the situation is that amongst plenty, there is scarcity. Plenty of food is available, but distribution of the same amongst the very poor and the destitute is scarce and non-existence, leading to mal malnourishment, starvation, and other related problems. Notably, the right to food derives not expressly from socioeconomic rights, but the court derived it as a part of right to life. And the court directed several schemes to be implemented. Each scheme was elaborately framed by the Supreme Court, and it was implemented, and one of the uh, one of the most significant, significant schemes was the uh, I mean, midday meal for the children in the schools, and that was very successful. Lastly, there are serious concerns about the judicial activism, and I would just uh, I mean, summarize them. So the, there are three important concerns. The first is the issue of legitimacy. The second is efficacy. And the third is the problem of creeping elitism that th threaten the progressive judicial activism heralded by the Indian judiciary. Now, the critics say that the court has clearly transcended the limits of the judicial functions and has undertaken functions that really belong to either the legislature or the executive. The court has been charged not only with exceeding its institutional capacity, but with reversing constitutional priorities, usurping both legislative and administrative functions, and riding roughshod over traditional rights. An area of concern that has been witnessed in recent times is the instances where the Supreme Court has issued some uh, far-reaching directions. One is direction to engineering of interlinking rivers in India. This is a so motto direction given by the court to interlink rivers. There are serious ecological, environmental, and human rights issues involved in interlinking the rivers. But nevertheless, the court issued that direction. The court has banned the pasting of black films on automotive windows. Then court has ordered exclusion of tourists in the core areas of tiger reserves. In reality, all these are managerial exercises which do not involve any fundamental rights issue or legal issues. 
I mean, the things have come to such a pass where the courts are controlling the traffic in Delhi. They are controlling the admission to the schools. So these are really not the areas where the court should be concerned. One of the most striking aspect of the Indian legal system, which one foreign observer has noticed, the extent to which formal legal arrangement exists in almost metaphysical isolation from social reality. It is hardly surprising, therefore, that while public interest litigation may have secured a better life for some individuals, it has not ended bonded labor nor found homes for the Bombay pavement dwellers. Litigative strategies can never substantially redistribute wealth and, or power, nor penetrate and affect the economic and cultural conditions which define the reality of Indian life. One former Chief Justice remarked, we must always remember that social action litigation is a necessary and valuable ally in the cause of the poor, but it cannot be a substitute for organization of the poor, development of community self-reliance, and establishment of effective organizational structures through which the poor can combat exploitation and injustice, protect and defend their interests, and secure their rights and entitlements. The other worry is the creeping, creeping elitism. See, what the court has done, it has widened the, the scope, widened the areas for PIL. So any person with, a, with his bona fide claim, he can approach the court. In 1980s, in response to a, a petition filed on behalf of the slum dwellers in Bombay, the court reasoned that evictions from the public lands would mean a loss of their means of livelihood and life. And the court articulated that right to livelihood is also is, is a right to life, is implicit in the right to life. And the court said, and I would quote those words, it is these men and women who have come to the court to ask for a judgment that they cannot be evicted from their squalid shelters without being offered alternative accommodation. And this plea was, was considered with great sensitivity in the a case known as Olga Telis. By 1996, the court approach, court's approach has changed. Now the cases are increasingly coming before the court initiated by the environmentalist and middle class property owners, and they are asking the court for clearance of the slums in the cities. In a waste disposal case by name Almitra, initiated by a public interest litigant, committed to the improvement of urban develop, imp, development, the court characterized the provision of alternative accommodation as rewarding wrongdoers. According to the court, the promise of free land at the taxpayer cost in place of a juggi, that's a, that's a hut, is a proposal which attracts more land grabbers. Rewarding an encroacher on public land with free alternative site is like giving reward to a pickpocket. So the whole perception of the court has changed. The court is more concerned about the urban elitist and not about the original rational of, of the uh, giving voice to the rightless people in India is fast disappearing. In response to a PIL filed by the Bombay Environmental Action Group, the Bombay High Court ordered the eviction of informal settlement dwellers adjacent to a national park, and as a result, half a million people were potentially affected. The court ordered that not only their huts, but also their all their belongings should be demolished. And this was, this order came to be passed in a public interest litigation. A similar decision was given by Delhi High Court to clear one of the biggest and oldest slums in Delhi on the bank of Yamuna River. The nearly uh, one lakh families were affected their juggies were demolished on the, on the orders of the court. And most surprisingly, the Commonwealth village, this was, these juggies were demolished on the ground that they were on the bank of river. And this is a cause for, for river pollution and no construction should be permitted on the bank of a river. And on the same place, the Commonwealth village was built by Delhi government after demolishing, I mean, 
all these chukkis and making lakhs of people homeless. So the conclusion is that, I mean, I would like to refer to an Australian academic, Professor Craven. He equates activism as progressivism. Activism, in my opinion, is related to change in power relations. A judicial interpretation that furthers the rights of disadvantaged sections or imposes curbs on absolute power of the state or facilitates access to justice is progressive activism. And in my opinion, such activism must be welcomed. This is applicable to both the expansions of substantive constitutional rights and the fashioning of new creative remedies like PIL or social interest litigation. However, as with all things, a balance must be struck. I already discussed the concerns of legitimacy, efficacy, and creeping elitism that threatened to tarnish India's excellent record of socially progressive judicial activism. It is also my belief that the process of rights expansionism cannot be taken too far. Recent decisions of the Indian courts have perhaps crossed this line. For instance, in a case earlier this year, police action on a sleeping crowd at a political rally was held to be in violation of the right to sleep peacefully. So the right to sleep was read in, the, in Article 21 of the Constitution. Now, constitutional jurisprudence tends to get fuzzy if existing category of rights are expanded willy-nilly. In the recent times, we also see the creation of a class of consumers who have developed vested interest in the use of the PIL. It may, be, may not be possible for the court to revert from the high-profile role it has projected through its decision. I think the court is now caught in an image trap. It may not be possible for the court to, to just relinquish its enormous power to, have to give ruling on all the aspects of the administration. I would like to end with a comment from Professor Bakshi, and that I took as a title to my lecture. He says that the growth in constitutional faith overloads adjudicatory power with great expectations, which it does not quite efficiently manage and which it may not always fulfill. The result has been that judicial activism is at once a peril and a promise, an assurance of solidarity for the depressed classes, as well as a site for, of betrayal. Courts are, at the end of the day, never an instrument of total societal revolution. They are best instruments of piecemeal social engineering at the most, never a substitute for direct political action. So undoubtedly, the Indian Supreme Court has performed, I mean, has achieved a great feat in, in, the, in social engineering, but by itself, the court cannot change the societal reality. And for that, I mean, the, the political establishment in the country has to be has to take the initiative. So I think I have overshot my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Justice Shah has agreed generously to take questions, and I think we might have time for one or two if you um, could just uh, indicate who you are when you ask your question, and because uh, there may be several questions, just be as brief as you can. Uh, thank you for a very interesting address. Uh, I believe from the uh, publicity that you, sir, were involved in the decision on the legalisation of uh, homosexuality. I'm just wondering what reaction there's been in India to that very brave decision. I will tell, tell you my own uh, experience. Uh, when I delivered the judgment, I didn't switch on the TV for almost till late evening. My wife was away. She called me that you are on TV all over and why don't you see it? I thought that there would be a backlash from the media and particularly from the regional media because these are very complicated issues of morality. But to my surprise, I mean, by and large, the reaction of the media is very positive, both English media as well as regional language media. 
and also the almost for all sections the decision was welcome some of the political parties directly came in support of the judgment the union of india has decided not to appeal against the judgment some of the religious leaders also supported the judgment uh, for example the uh, i think it was church of uh, south india the the their uh, someone from their side said that the christianity disapproves uh, homosexuality but it also doesn't believe in punishing a homosexual another muslim scholar said so what is prohibited by islam is not the individual act of homosexuality but it's a, some such mass acts or something of that sort so by and large i think the the indian society has received the judgment in a positive way okay. i think we have time for one last question so i have that one to you is um, keeping in mind article 21 of the indian constitution and how it encompasses a lot of different um, subcategory of rights uh, what are your thoughts sir on the right to include uh, the right to end one's life oh yes where the quality of life is not expressly defined by the constitution and where one can define what one's quality of life is how would you then include the right See, to end one's life oh yes just i will have to just uh, explain a little background this question came before the supreme court and it was held that the right to die is also part of article 21 that was on a very simple simplistic reasoning that right to speech includes right not to speak so therefore right to live also includes right to die that was a, it's not a good decision so anyway that was reversed and the supreme court said that life is precious i mean there is no such right recognized by the constitution now this question has come up again there is a jain uh, tradition jains are i mean they are similar to i am a jain it's similar to buddha believe in ahimsa and jain monks follow a practice called santhara so santhara is a practice where the not necessarily a monk but any person can just give up taking food or water and he simply after some time i mean his death is inevitable so that particular provision that particular practice is now questioned in rajasthan high court but it's a very sensitive issue now it is religious rights they sorry the right to life is pitted against the right to religion and there is another uh, aspect of this right to uh, uh, right to die and that is attempt to commit suicide is a is an offense under the ipc so if a person commits to att att attempts to commit suicide and is fortunately he survives he is to face a prosecution <laughs> for making an attempt and i think india is only one of the half a dozen countries we still retains the law and lastly the aspect of this particular uh, is the the what about this cases where the where there is no chance of survival of the patient it's a really it it arose in the case of a nurse in bombay she was brutally assaulted and raped by a by a ward boy and she is lying in coma for last 16 years so this matter went to supreme court and the supreme court complicated the things supreme court said that the till now the in india the doctors used to simply tell the relations that there is no hope so this all life saving apparatus would be removed and the person would be sent home for a peaceful death in his, with his family but the court has now said that the there has to be a board of doctors and those that board of directors should doc, doctor should certify whether this is a case for withdrawal of the life saving equipment that has complicated the issue i'm afraid i really must bring this fascinating discussion to a close um i in doing so i want to, um to extend um our thanks to justice shah um 
Uh, from the perspective of a constitutionalist, comparative constitutional law is something like a form of travel. It uh, delights and fascinates us and disorients us, but its most lasting benefits uh, lie in its capacity to make us really think about whether those aspects of our own systems are as necessary as they seem to be to us. And the description tonight that we've had of the Indian judiciary administering the Indian constitution is just about as foreign to the Anglo-Australian tradition as I almost could imagine, challenging its fundamental structures, the structure of rights, the nature of evidence, the, en the nature of remedies. And he's painted for us the picture of a court which is an energetic participant in the governance in, in India. And most of all, and to my great delight, he's made it quite clear that the term judicial activism, which is hurled usually as a term of abuse in public debate in Australia, is one that, in the right circumstances, Justice Shah would be prepared to accept as a compliment. <laughs> he's done all of this while introducing us to the critique of the Indian courts and making a call for balance. And for that exceptionally rich and not a critical account of the Indian uh, judiciary, we are uh, greatly indebted. It leaves us with much to contemplate and um, we have a great intellectual gift from India uh, given to us tonight and we're very, very grateful for it. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Shah. Thank you.